Good afternoon. I'm Colleen Miller. I'm Director of Leadership Development for the Washington State School Directors Association. And thank you all for joining us today. I'm excited to start our webinar, but before I do, I just want to go through a few housekeeping items. We encourage you to ask questions or provide feedback using the question box on your GoToMeeting tool panel. We will definitely have questions and answers at the end, but if you have a question that I can thread in and share, share with our expert today, I'll try to do that too. This webcast is being recorded, and a copy of it as well as the slide deck will be posted on our webinar sometime tomorrow. So you'll be able to, let's say you're the one board member from your board attending our webinar, you could share, share this with the remainder of, of your board if that would be, the information would be helpful to them. So with that, I'll introduce our first speaker today. Joining us is Barbara Posthumus from the Lake Washington School District. She has been with the, that school district for 23 years and focusing on the area of school finance and budgeting. She's an active member of the Washington Association of School Business Officials. And Barbara is one of those folks that her colleagues turn to for advice and assistance on the matter of school finance. So with that, I'm going to hand it over to pa Barbara Posthumus, and we're going to take a dive into bonds and levies due to the great success so many of our district, districts had in passing those bonds and levies. So with that, I'm handing the mic off to Barbara. Great. Hey, Colleen, thank you very much, and thank you for having me uh, present today. Um, this is uh, uh, part one uh, I did a few months ago uh, for no, new board members, and um, today we decided, uh, given uh, budget season and that many of districts have passed uh, new bonds and levies um, that we thought we'd focus uh, this topic today on bonds and levies. But if there's other questions relating to just regular budgeting um, items, general fund items, I please feel free to ask um, and I will answer you know any questions I can. Um, oh, that sounds great. So sorry, I <laughs> Sorry, I forgot to close out a program that I need to close out, so apologize for that. Um, the, um, so the agenda today, what we're going to, what I will be covering is we're going to talk about budgeting for capital levies, budgeting for bonds. Um, I'm going to review um, some debt service limitations. And then some of you may have some questions about front funding uh, and the possibilities if that's something that's doable uh, for your bonds and levies. So, and I hope to cover some suggestions for you as board members on how best to uh, do some monitoring in these areas. So let's jump right into capital levies. Um, for those districts that have um, passed levies this, this levy season, um, collection on those levies begins in the spring. And typically you collect about 53% of the levy in the spring and 47% in the fall. Um, if you haven't had a levy before, um, then you're going to only receive half of the collection. Your budget for the, that your district office will be putting together, the 2014-15 budget, will only include the spring collection. And then the second year, the 2015-16, will include 100% of the annualized levy. And again, I'll give you an example of that. So if you have a, and also I want to add, you know, I come from Lake Washington School District, large school district perspective. I will also try to keep the small district perspective in mind, but um, that's just my lens uh, where I am. So um, if you pass a $5 million levy over four years for a total of $20 million, then most likely you're going to receive about 2.6 million of that in your 14-15 revenue budget and then you will be able to spend that money in the 14-15 school year. And then the next year um, you'll receive 47% um, 5 million times 47% in the fall and 5 million times 53% the next spring uh, for a total of $5 million for the 15-16 school year. So a four-year levy actually affects 
six years because it affects the first year you collected half a year, the next three years, and then the year after, or the next four years, and the year after that, you'll have another half a year. So just something to look when you uh, when you're presented with the budget. And for those districts that have technology levies, um, there are special rules with technology levies. Um, if your levy included um, dollars to fund things like staff training or software um, related training related to those technology systems that you buy, for example, if you buy new laptops and you're going to do some instructional uh, new instruction using those laptops, then the training that you provide teachers, that your district provides teachers, can be paid for out of the technology levy, but OSPI requires that we actually spend the dollars in the general fund. So what is what can be very confusing for, um, you know, potentially for board members, for the community, is that we have to um, spend the money in another fund and then we transfer the levy that was received to the general fund. So let me just say that more specifically. Your technology levy revenue will be deposited into the capital projects fund, but you're, if you're going to spend any of that money on staff training and software, it must be transferred, the revenue must be transferred to the general fund and the expenditures actually occur in the general fund. Um, so, and the, the, there are technical rules, you know, staff training and software, there's, there's specific technical language that, that your district will need to read and clarify. It's, it's the training has to relate to application and modernization of technology systems and then software licenses, subscriptions, and applications. And so any training related to the installation and integration. So that just, that's something, if that's happening in your district, it, it just is something that has to be explained during the budget process and when the budget is being presented to the public. So I'm on facilities levies, for those of you that have facility levies, 100% of the revenue and expenditures do stay in the capital projects fund. So you'll receive those levy dollars as per the schedule, and then you'll spend those as you uh, best see fit. So the good news is you don't have to do any transfers for facility levies. So I'm going to move on to um, budgeting for bonds. And congratulations to those districts that um, have passed your bonds. That is a um, fabulous feat. Um, unfortunately, Lake Washington School District did not pass its bond, and so we are we are in a, a, a reassessing our next steps for that. But uh, we know that uh, those of you that did pass a bond, it's just fabulous, fabulous news. So the next steps once once you pass your bond is your district will need to determine, you know, when is the best time to sell the bonds, um, when do you need the cash. Um, uh, you have to be able to, depending on the size of your bond, um, you have to be able to, and the projects that you're doing, you may not sell the bond all in one um, amount. You'll sell it over time because you have to be able to show that um, you need to spend 85% of the proceeds within three years. So if you have a very large um, bond, um, for example, if your bond is for one elementary, typically that's going to be built, you can get those built within three years. But if it's for a very large project, such as a secondary school, you probably, your district is probably going to need to sell those bonds in phases because you're going to be building that building uh, probably in more than three years. Um, so your business office and superintendent will be working with the bond underwriter and advisor to, to sell the bonds and determine um, the best time to do that. Um, in order to sell bonds, of course, the board will need to pass a resolution. Um, and then uh, the other part of selling bonds is that the superintendent and business office have to conduct, it's called a rating agency call, 
those those are held with standards and Coors and Moody's, and um, they have to they have to rate our bonds. And in order to do that, they look at um, financial factors, they look at economic factors, they look at administrative leadership, and so you and uh, your bond underwriter, the district and the bond underwriter will be um, getting data together to prepare for that call and, and make those. And then once those calls happen, the rating agencies rate your district bonds and then um, the bonds can be sold. So the other um, uh, thing to think about as you're budgeting for bonds is when there are bonds, they impact two funds, the revenue from the bond sale and, of course, the construction expenses go into the capital projects fund. But then you also have to pay your principal and interest, your debt payments on the bonds must be paid out of the debt service fund. So your presented budget is going to reflect um, either if you've already sold bonds and you know um, the amounts, then that's going to be reflected in the budget. If you don't know, if you haven't sold bonds and you're still working on your plans, maybe you're going to sell bonds in the fall, then the budget needs to reflect estimated amounts if prior to the actual sale. So the district office will make sure that um, you know that's hopefully clear and that um, they're putting estimates in the budget, and they may need to put additional contingency in the budget if things, you know, depending on how the bond sale occurs in the fall. Um, and then as part of budgeting for bonds, you need to make sure that um, or your, your district will be setting the debt service levy um, amount, and that amount needs to be sufficient enough to pay off the annual principal and interest due on those bonds. So all of those, so that's, your district will be working with the bond underwriter to, to come up with a payment schedule and for the potential sale of those bonds, and then that payment schedule will drive the amount um, that needs to be levied. And I'll, we'll talk about the levy amount in a couple more slides. As, as um, districts do have limits on how much debt they can have. Um, and there's a lot of content on these slides, and I'll try not to read every word, but uh, the district cannot exceed 5%, your total debt cannot exceed 5% of the value of your taxable property, so 5% of your assessed valuation. And this includes both non-voted debt and all voted debt. Um, so, um, so the voter-approved bond capacity could exceed the 5%, but the principal amount of the bond sale is limited to the debt capacity. So if you're, uh, if you're a small school district, you may have to structure your bond issues differently than large districts due to these debt limitations. So as an example, um, uh, Griffin School District has an AV assessed valuation of $1.3 million. Their debt limitation would be $65 million. They already have outstanding debt of $13 million and non-voted debt of $300,000, but they need to build a new high school of $100 million. So they've got to you know, look at how the state matching funds and how much they can issue. The maximum bond issue would be about $52 million. So they'd have to do that in multiple increments. Um, so it may mean that the cost of the issuance is um, a little more because they're doing it in multiple um, but it also gives them available capacity. So those are just something to be aware of as you're issuing debt or going out to your voters for additional bonds. So Barbara, so, I, I have a question. Um, okay, great. So the information you shared is, looks like it's very, very important in the planning stages in terms it, of the amount of debt, the limitations, all those those pieces when to, to to sell the bonds. So yes. in preparation for a bond, would a district start a year ahead? At least. I, I think that's that's a great question, Connie. And so yes, there's a lot of planning that goes into getting ready to sell bonds. And um, sorry, my um, 
computer keeps popping up with these messages. So there's a lot of preparation that goes into selling bonds and really that work should be done prior to um, getting ready to ask the voters for a bond sale because those are some of the questions they're going to be asking. How does this affect my tax rate? How many, you know, how much how much bond, how many, what's the dollar amount of the bonds you're going to be selling, when are you going to be selling those, and um, so uh, a lot of legwork goes into that ahead of time. And hopefully then, once you have your plan in place and, and the voters approve the bonds, you can implement that plan. But the other thing that happens that can happen is economic conditions can change. So maybe you plan to sell bonds in May or June and something significant happened with the stock market and so it might be better to delay um, selling those bonds or, or it might be better to sell them earlier. So, so a lot of things can go into that and, and factor and it's also, you know, um, if you have building permit issues or, you know, your construction plans change, um, all of those things uh, can impact the original plan that you put together. So. Um, well, absolutely. That's yeah, good. thank That's you. Very good to know. Very good for our board directors to know about the, the scope of it, as you described. Yes, thank you. Um, so uh, there's other just debt limitations um, and um, there's different bonds for LGOs, there's lines of credit, there's leases, um, and but these are all examples of non-voted debt, so which have different rules. And so all non-voted debt is limited to three eighths of one percent. Nice, you know, figure that everybody should remember <laughs> of the value of taxable property with it within the district. Um, the other limitation that that um, a school district uh, need to look out for is you also can have to make sure you're not levying your debt service uh, fund fund balance cannot be too high so if you've got a cash balance in your debt service fund you've got to make sure you can only assess you can only levy from voters what you need to pay back the principal and interest on bonds you shouldn't be creating I mean the intent of these rules are so that districts don't start accumulating a fund balance. So there are also rules that your debt service fund balance needs to be depleted about once each year, but you can have a reasonable reserve of approximately one twelfth of the prior year's principal and interest expense. So usually there's a low point in your, as you're, as the, um, as you're seeing the cash flows in, ins and out, there's usually a low point in December after payments are made in bonds. Bonds are typically, uh, the principal and interest payments are typically due twice a year in December and June. And so those are the big um, payouts that uh, happen twice a year. So this next slide is just an example of uh, a district that used some non-voted debt. Um, uh, there's a program called the State Treasurer's Local Program and they purchase school buses over a 13-year term and then they're making payments utilizing um, the depreciation money they receive in the transportation vehicle fund each year. So they, they by using the, this program, they did not have to go out and request a levy from their voters, but they could um, you know, get a, uh, a loan basically over time and then pay that back with the money they had. So as I mentioned, uh, one of the things as you're working on your planning, and as Connie also said, you know, these plans are typically done ahead of time before you're asking your voters um, to approve bonds. You're wanting to make sure that when you um, uh, ask your voters for the levy, the debt service levy that will pay back the principal and interest on those bonds, you're want, you, uh, your district is putting together a schedule to determine how that's going to be, Are you? do you want a level tax rate, do you want the tax rate to be going down, how can those bonds be structured to make sure the tax, your total tax rate for the district um, is where you want it to be and or where your district wants it to be. So in this chart, um, over time, the, the bond tax rate, you can see it fluctuates um, but it, but you also have to look at how that merges in with the levy 
rates, your other levy rates, um, and to make sure uh, where, you, where you want your rate to be um, over the multiple years. So if there's, um, and for those districts, some districts have multiple bonds, so they're paying off bonds that they maybe were approved 10 years ago, and then they have new bonds that are being approved. And so there's a lot of work that goes behind the scenes in structuring um, the bond payments so that you have level tax rates. So that's what's going on behind the scenes to get those tax rates level. Um, the other topic I want to talk about today is front funding. I uh, recently received a call from a small district that had just passed their first technology levy, have not had one before, and um, so the question was asked, can, and they wanted to buy some laptops this summer to be implemented in the fall, and, um, but of course, the collection of the levy will not happen until next spring. So they asked the question about front funding. So can you spend dollars from voted levies or bonds prior to collection? And the answer is maybe. Okay, I don't want to come out and just say yes or no, but the answer is maybe. It, it really depends on um, you know, what each district's plans are. If you have reserves, if you have reserves in your capital projects fund, so if you have a fund balance that is uh, it's re reserved, maybe it's um, leftover levy dollars, maybe it's or unspent levy dollars, I shouldn't say leftover, but it's unspent levy dollars, maybe it's impact and mitigation fees. If you have reserves and other funds that you could use to front fund by those laptops now, you can do that, but there is there is rules that you need to follow in order to do that, that your district needs to follow. You need to clearly track these expenditures separately so that, um, because essentially what you're doing is borrowing from one source, one levy source, to pay for another levy source. And so, or you, another way of saying it, you are using your old source to pay for laptops and then when the new money comes in, you're going to pay back that source. Um, so if you have um, if you have reserves, it's a possibility to do that. You need to clearly track your expenditures, and you need a clear cash flow plan. Um, so an example would be is if you've got a million dollars in your ending fund balance, you know, can you spend $500,000 for, again, as I mentioned, laptops. Um, so it is possible, but here's some reasons you may not want to do that. If you do use your reserves to front fund, then those reserves will not be available for emergencies. Um, it also could show a negative fund balance line item. So let me explain that in more detail. On your capital projects fund, it tracks your fund balance by category, by bonds, by levies, by uh, state assistance, by mitigation and impact fees. If your total cash balance is a million dollars and it's all in, in bond reserves, for example, and you start spending levy reserves that you've never had before, or levy money, sorry, that you've never had before, you don't have any reserves right now in levy, but you go ahead and front fund this these laptop expenditures, then your balance in that line item at the end of the year will show a negative number. Now the overall fund balance will still be a positive number. So you'll have a million dollars in bonds for bond balance, you'll have a negative balance in levies, and it will be a positive 500 balance at the end. That is not technically a problem from a, a budgetary standpoint, but it just means there's extra communication because there's people, you know, people don't like to see negative numbers. That, that brings up different meanings. So it's just something that, you know, have that conversation. I know that um, while you may want to, obviously we want to get those computers in with kids and we want to uh, work, use that now, but it just, there are impacts for doing that. And, um, it's also, you know, I have a 
I have a daughter going off to college, and of course we, we raise our kids, you know, don't spend the money until you've earned it. Um, but it's also, you know, talking about good borrowing versus bad borrowing. If you have the ability to front fund, and it's it's what's best for kids, then then it's there's no nothing that says you can't do it. I your district staff will though need to uh, consult with legal counsel um, just to be sure. So I you know don't take my word for it that that I've said yes or said no. It really it's it's a legal issue in some cases. So um, so but it can be done. So the other um, just reminders about when districts are budgeting for capital projects, um, for the, if if your district has is uh, has a brand new levy, hasn't had a levy or facility levy before, um, then this may not be a big issue. But many districts have multiple levies going on at the same time. They have levies, they have bonds. Um, they are still spending dollars from prior levies that are being that have been passed, and then they're going to start spending monies on the future levies that have been passed. So, what is um, hopefully um, what's best for transparency is that in those budgets, that the sources where the money is coming from is being clearly identified. So, as you, as the budget shows uh, where the money is being spent. It's identified. I'm spending that out of the 2010 levy. This project is being spent out of the 2014 levy. This project is a bond project, the bond that was approved, um, you know, in 2010. So making sure it's very clear where those sources of funds um, are coming from. Um, and then, as I mentioned, having multiple levies cross over the years. So finally, um, monitoring and reporting. Um, if For those of you that may have been in my first presentation, we talked about um, the monthly board financial reports that your districts provide you. Um, those are things where, where you as a board member will be reviewing um, the spending plans in both the, in the general fund and the capital projects fund in the debt service fund and you can see um, the things we talked about. Are there transfers going between the capital projects fund to the general fund? Are they, um, you know, how are the, uh, how is the spending going compared to the budget? And again, if we know that the budget, when we put the debt service budget together, that it was just a plan and now that we, we actually have sold the bonds, those numbers may have changed. So. Um, one of the things that may happen, and this this can happen if you're if you're a district that has a new bond, and as you start spending money on construction for, for example, for an elementary school, um, the uh, what when typically when you hire when the district hires the construction um, contractor. Typically, districts are putting in commitments to that contractor for the whole project. That may cause, on the financial reports that you receive from your district, that could cause you to see that they've encumbered money when you when you do a when you do a commitment or a purchase order for um, con the construction contract. You're going to encumber the cost of the whole project. Well, that project is going to be paid for though over multiple years. So some things that could happen is you may, your budget is a one-year plan, but you may have outstanding encumbrances showing for multiple years. So that's just something to be aware of. And of course, each district is unique in that, and that's something you can ask your um, business manager if you have concerns when you're reviewing the capital projects expenditures. Um, District staff also have reporting requirements to OSPI if they are they are receiving state assistance on construction projects. So there is a lot of reporting. Um, uh, while it's exciting to have a bond and be able to build schools, there is a lot of reporting that goes on um, behind the scenes on that. So, um, so the other thing you can do um, in your budget is if you choose to, you could 
budget the full amount of a project. So uh, even though the um, the expenditures were happening over multiple years, the budget could reflect the full amount of the project. So you don't get into the the negative balances due to the encumbrance issue that I mentioned. So you may see that um, as your budget is presented to you from the district. So um, some additional resources that uh, you may, if you're interested, that have some information on budgeting overall, but also talk about capital uh, projects budget and um, technology levies is organization and financing of Washington Public Schools. And then there's also some good information on the OSPI website on how to funding resources for school facilities. So some of those things I mentioned, like the state local program, that information is on the um, OSPI website. So, um, so my presentation was a little shorter today, and I'm happy to open it up for questions. Um, and uh, again, we can talk about anything. It doesn't have to be limited to capital and um, debt service. We can talk about general fund, what, what are some things you're hearing out there or questions you have relating to state funding um, and budgeting. So I'm watching for, for, for questions, Robert, to pass on to you. But a question that I have when I was thinking about if I was a school director, and this is the first time I'd really done a, a deeper dive on this topic, mm -hmm. um, so would it be worth their, their time to perhaps meet with their business officer and talk about if there's multiple levies and bonds and what the status of, of the district is at regarding bonds and levies? Yeah, I think that's a great idea. I think any new board members, I, I think it's very beneficial to sit down with your business manager and just kind of learn what are some of the nuances in bonds and levies in, in your district and um, because you know they can be com they can be simple but they also can be complicated so it's good to know um, in each district is unique so it's good to know what's happening in your district. So we have a request from one of our board directors to ask you to please define debt service. Okay, so the debt service fund is the fund that we are required to track um, any principal, any payments for debt. So if you issue debt, which issuing bonds, selling bonds is issuing debt. It's like your, you, it's similar to your mortgage on your house. You are asking for a mortgage and then you have to pay principal and interest back over time. So. Um, we're required to pay for that debt out of the debt service fund. And so the and how you get revenue in the debt service fund is revenue is received by levying taxes for voters. So you can levy taxes to voters and they give you that authorization when they approve the bond at the ballot. They give you authorization as a district to tax voters the amount they need to pay back the principal and interest on the bonds. So the revenue from de the debt service fund comes from um, taxes from voters. Also a little bit of revenue comes from interest if there's money already in your debt service fund. And then expenditures in the debt service fund are the principal and interest payments on um, any bonds or any debt, and it doesn't have to be, you know, it can also be uh, any other leases or any other debt um, that I talked about in my private slides would come out of the debt service fund. So, so does that help? You build your bond, you've got to be prepared to also think about uh, what, um, which what tax service, debt service you're going to take care of out of the, the levy. Correct. That's great. So let's yeah. say I was, I'm in a school, school district that passed a bond er, earlier this year in 2013. Um, what might I be seeing right now when they're talking about bonds and, and levies as my district is gearing up? So if you passed a bond, um, 
you know, just recently, what might you be seeing? Um, as I mentioned, uh, they're going to be gearing up for the bond, the actual sale of the bonds to get the cash um, to start building the projects. They're going, you're going to be seeing planning for the projects that the voters approved. Um, so you're going to be, um, as a board, you're, if, again, you have to approve, a resolution has to go to the board in order for you to sell bonds. So not only did a resolution go to the board in order to put the bond on the ballot, but once the voters approve the bond, then a resolution has to go to the board as, you're, as the district is getting ready to sell bonds. Um, and then once that happens, you'll see the results of that information um, in the budget document when it's presented to you by the district. Um, I know in our district, uh, when we were preparing for our bond um, that went before the voters, we put together, so our budget, our current budget, our 13-14 budget, we already budgeted um, the assumption, we made the assumption in that budget, we put capacity in that budget, if we needed to do a bond sale for the spring of 14. So uh, we made sure the budget included enough capacity so that we um, could do the, the bond sale if we needed to right away. Um, so some districts will budget that ahead of time. Other districts, you may have to do a budget revision. If, if I didn't build that capacity in my budget, then I would, and I want to sell bonds right away, then I am going to need to potentially do a budget extension, which the board needs to approve um, to increase the capacity of my budget. And that's typically, you know, both in the debt service fund and in the capital projects fund, depending on how much capacity was in there. So those are things that could be happening. Oh, oh that's great to know. That's great to know for looking ahead. We have another yeah. question. Okay. What data should board members be tracking to monitor the financial health of the district? Mm -hmm. um, so what data should board members be tracking? So um, that's a great question. So you will be getting uh, the board reports that board members receive uh, monthly from the district should be showing uh, not only um, each fund, so for the general fund, for the capital projects fund, the debt service fund, transportation vehicle fund, and the ASB fund, so for all five funds, you will be getting um, what I call status reports. It will show, it should show you the current budget. It should show you how much has been spent to date. Um, it should show you what's outstanding. Um, and it will, it, your reports also may sh compare how how does where you are this year, you know, how much have you spent through, for example, May of this year compared to how much did a district spend through May of last year? So in the general fund, that kind of statistic can show you if there's, um, uh, if you're spending a lot more than you did at this time last year, then maybe, and there could be reasons for it, but that just is an indicator of some changes that are happening. Um, now, that indicator isn't as significant in the capital projects fund, for example, or the transportation vehicle fund, because every year in those funds are different. If I, you know, build lots of, if I am doing a lot of construction one year and not much the next year, then comparing how much I spent, you know, through May from the prior year to the current year may not be as valuable. But again, all those indicators. Um, the other thing to look for as you're reviewing um, the balances, I mentioned, you know, looking at outstanding encumbrances. It will show you are there, uh, what are the balances um, versus my budgeted expenditures versus how much I've spent so far and what's outstanding. Um, and then if there's concerns, you should be asking your business manager about those. Um, another thing to look for is the revenues. Um, and, and on those reports, it will show what was the revenue plan, what was the plan for bringing in levy taxes and, and uh, debt service taxes, and then how are those revenues coming in versus our plan. So just looking at, at really how, how you're doing um, compared to the plan. 
But remember, the budget is just that. It is just a plan, and it may need to change. And there are reasons for it changing, and, and, um, and those reasons can be explained if they need to be. So, um, and I think, uh, as Connie mentioned, as we talked about earlier, especially with bonds and with debt, a lot of that information that impacts your, levy, your tax levy rate and uh, the schedule, the district is working on those details behind the scenes before the bond sale, and those are things that you as a board member could just ask for information on from the business manager. They're typic that information typically isn't that much deep level of detail isn't included in the monthly um, board reports typically. So, so we have another question for you. It starts with a okay. comment. Okay. Very informative presentation, Barbara. Thank you. <laughs> I'm in a school district that will be losing some control over about one million dollars in Title I funding because our state lost the ESEA waiver. Right. Do you have any resources or advice on how to factor this into the budgeting process? Okay, good question. So um, what districts are up against is, you know, this has been a big topic all around the state and it's been in the news is um, that districts now have to set aside. So it, it's not that they're losing Title I dollars, but they now have to take that same money they received last year and set aside a certain amount for um, after school support for students or tutoring or, or um, different things. So districts may have used, many districts use that money for additional um, staff FTE and now they're re being required to use that money for set-asides, so what we call set-asides. So from a budgeting standpoint, what we're doing in our district is we're doing just that. We're taking the, um, the budget document that is presented to you in the spring by the district is still going to show your total revenue, same revenue that you received last year. There's a, some adjustments from year to year. The total revenue will still be budgeted, but it then the detail, at the detail level, it's how is that um, revenue going to be spent. And so what we're doing in our district is we're taking the total Title I resources that we have and, frank, and we're doing just that. We are pulling out what we are required to set aside and then we're re determining what's left, what can we use to hire teachers or do the programs that we want to continue to do, and budgeting, budgeting that, and then the set-aside money is going to be budgeted in um, either contractual services or um, extra time per diem. It could still be if, they're, if you're hiring teachers to do after-school work, that's how it could be budgeted. Um, so I think it is a dilemma that districts are still struggling with um, because if um, if you know if they've already committed those dollars to those people, then decisions have to be made on and on how to re you know do we cut cut those programs? Do we use some of the general fund money that we receive, the new money that we receive from the state, in order not to cut those programs? Um, but it is a dilemma, and and um, in our district, we've been fortunate to have a little bit of carryover, so we can cushion some of the the blow from these changes. Um, so it is going to be an individual district by district, um, you know, decision and impact. Unfortunately, so yeah, and it's a big topic around the state. You're absolutely right. Yes. I hear about it all the time. Yes. So, Right now, we don't have another question up on the board, okay. so we can wind down our uh, presentation today, I think. What okay. I'd like to do is, first is, is to thank you, Barbara, for this fabulous, this is so informative, this is so very, very helpful. And thank we will you. Um, archive this on our website, and I would encourage board directors who, who are participating, really think about taking adva advantage of our webinar series, and particularly, the, the right. finance pieces. This, right. this PowerPoint and presentation and the narrative that, that Bar Barbara provides um, might help you, you know, come to a shared understanding of um, the bigger picture of the financial health, health of your, your school district. 
Right. And so it might be an interesting professional de development activity for, for, for your board to go through this webinar with your business officer and superintendent. And so that you really get, you can really deepen your foundations on how you understand and monitor the financial health of, of your school district. Yeah, great. So, and if, and Connie, I just want to add if there are topics or if there are areas that I haven't covered that you're very interested in hearing more about, please let Connie, you know, please let Connie give that feedback to Connie. And, um, you know, we could certainly, you know, do part three uh, sometime down the road. <laughs> So. Oh, that's great. That's great. Yes, we want to hear, hear from, from our members, certainly. Absolutely. So Barbara, thank you again. And just so, uh, I just want to mention what a brave presenter Barbara is, because just before we started, she realized there was a bee buzzing around in her office. <laughs> and thankfully, hopefully, it kept in the corner farthest from her. <laughs> she is safe and sound. So thank yep. you again, and thank everyone for attending. Thank you very much.